Hello and welcome to the Guitar Hang Podcast. I'm your host, John Stancor. Today's hang is with the incredibly talented Nashville guitarist, Corey Congilio. You might know him from his diverse musical endeavors, which include his solo work, his informative YouTube channel, and his outstanding guitar courses on TrueFire, such as the Working Class Guitar Course. Get ready for a fantastic journey through the musical universe of Corey Congilio. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell for notifications. And now, let's hang with Corey Congilio. Wouldn't you agree we're in the golden age of all things guitar? We will look back on this and say, my gosh, this is this is an amazingly struggle. You know, it is and it isn't. The The beauty of it is that everything is available to us. Yes. The problem with that is that do we spend too much time being, you know, uh, sort of titillated by everything around us as opposed to focusing on playing and making music. Right. You know, that's the, the division, I think. I think more people are getting into guitar than ever before. There's a lot of material out there. What they decide to do with it and how it advances their musicality. That's, but as long as people are, you know, still getting into it, finding joy and excitement from it, uh, I watched one of your videos and it, it took me back to 1989, the, the Larry Carlton video, the instruction yeah. video, where he's talking about uh, the super arpeggio concept. And I remember when I watched that for the first time, it took me back to a music store that I would go to where you could rent these little VHS tapes. And it was like every week, even though these guys were beyond me, this is in the middle 80s, I would say, mid to late 80s. Um, it was just exciting to pre-internet to see these amazing players playing directly and seemingly talking to you, the uh, the viewer. Right. So that was kind of like a, a really early precursor to the whole idea of having a YouTube instruction and that sort of thing, which was yeah. very cool. Totally. It's funny. I worked in a music store that had those deep, those VHS tapes and and rented them as well. And I would, I would snag them and take them home. Yeah. And then and then uh, once VHS to DVD recording became possible, I was pirating all of them, you know, <laughs> just to have them. Uh, and I don't know where any of them are anymore. But uh, we have your house surrounded, by the way. So yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> we all did that it was fantastic oh man i went to i went to great lengths uh to do that kind of stuff in its infancy you know finding pirated software to take the anti-piracy stuff off of the dvd <laughs> yeah. but i don't do that anymore so you can't right. prove it right exactly <laughs> even though i'm on record yeah so that was a, a great way of uh i i don't know if we're contemporaries but i was born in 65 i'm 58 when I was, I came up in the era really of the, the hair metal band, mm -hmm. that really when I got playing in earnest, I started late. I don't know if you started in school. I didn't. I'm glad I didn't. I would never have finished school because I was so lost to guitar. <clears throat> yeah, the whole idea of um, not being able to uh, look like any of those hair metal guys, it got me more into the studio players. I got very excited about checking out the studio players. So Larry Carlton was one of those guys. I was like, oh my God, there's an instructional video of Larry Carlton. Oh, and Steve Lukather or two. Yeah. So I don't know what your, maybe you could share your early uh, playing experience, how, how you came up through the, uh, the gigging, learning, taking lessons, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I kind of, I'm at that weird age where I was on the tail end of the hair metal thing and then the beginning of the grunge era. Right. Um, but all of that kind of stuff was really fleeting for me. Something told me early on that learning eruption was never going to make me money. And I wanted, I knew at 13 when I started playing that I was going to be a professional in some capacity. Right. And Something told me that, yeah, that's cool and that's impressive. I'm just using eruption as an example. Yeah. But learning how to be a musician 
in the sense of covering any kind of territory would lead to a more uh, sort of consistent career. Now, the thing is, if you have the ability to to be an Eddie Van Halen type of person, as an example, go full on in that direction and it might really work out for you. But I didn't have that kind of confidence. Um, I just said, well, probably because I grew up in a real blue collar situation. It's like, well, it's only for gifted people. But I didn't realize that the gift I had was the ability to adapt into any environment and, you know, come out with my head above water. So that was really important to me um, was to try to learn as much as I could about covering ground. And what I mentioned that I kind of, you know, straddled the line between hair metal and grunge. Those were all like, uh, you know, just things that made me excited about music. Once I really started to learn music, I definitely got into more of the sort of players like, you know, Robin Ford and Larry Carlton and people like, and then I, met some people that were much more accomplished than, than me that turned me on to a whole other slew of, of players like that, that weren't rock stars necessarily, you know? Right. right. Yeah. The, um, yeah, when you're, it's amazing how that your formulative years as a kid and your, the internal dialogue, you say, you say you grew up in a blue collar family, the same, for, same for me. And it was, uh, one of those things where I felt like I was going to make a career somehow in playing music. But for me, because I felt so much of the image was tied to your abilities. I yeah. Mean, you'd be a great player, but in that era, either, either the hair metal or the grunge era, you had to have a certain look or a certain aesthetic. Uh, I had a face for radio, you know, I, <laughs> it was, I was going to have to do something in the studio realm or what I later found out was uh, I got in the early 2000s started a series of different tribute bands. I in my 15th year with a touring with a Pink Floyd tribute group, but I'd done the Steely Dan tribute thing and a Beatles thing with without dressing up as the Beatles. But that was a a very financially viable way to not only grow as a musician, because there's nothing that will your abilities together quite like having people paying money to see you cover yeah. different artists so uh i'm kind of interested in hearing about how your how that process went from for you from learning and gigging to where you are now you know doing sessions doing touring doing creating youtube content that sort of thing um could you possibly rephrase that question yeah, I, I'm interested to hear your your genesis from a player starting out. Oh, okay. At the crossroads of whether or not to learn eruption to where you are right. now. All all your travails from from gigging to maybe doing some studio work, some touring, or whatever wherever those paths may have taken you to today. Sure. Yeah, I'm like everyone. It's it's a long story that probably starts in a similar way. You, you get a spark. You know, I had family members that played music. Uh, I started playing saxophone. Um, I realized I couldn't, you never saw anybody really front a band with a saxophone, you know what I mean? But I wanted to be in the high school or middle school band at the time. And right. I was a real fan. There was a lot of fifties music around my house too. There was all kinds of music, but a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and it always looked like cool when the saxophone player played a solo, but my band instructors never taught me how to improvise and that's really what I wanted to do so when I got a guitar that stuff started coming a lot more easily to me and I remember just walking home from school listening to Metallica or ZZ Top or anywhere in between and saying oh I think I could play that and I walk home and I go to my bedroom and I figure it out and in about a half an hour I'm playing one of those kinds of things and I, that sounds like oh are you saying you're a virtuoso no not at all it was just I just had an ear for oh I think that lives here on the guitar let's pick around and find it right. so as that started to develop I, I got more interested in you know seeing how this stuff works and wow those people seem to make a living at it how do I do that and um the only in a small town the only really outlet is cover bands and wedding bands which are basically the same thing but the wedding bands probably make more money <laughs> well they certainly do but cover bands make money too so for me that's what i had to prove to my my immediate family that like i'm good enough to do this 
for a living and I, and I would work my tail off to try and do it. And I immediately gravitated towards more blues and blues rock. I was just interested in that. It was, there was a lot of that being played in my family too. Um, but uh, it, it was, it was an evolution of how do I survive playing music only? And that started, I'm a pretty resourceful guy. And that went to, well, I'm going to go work at this music store because I can meet people and I can get a discount on gear. Boom, check, let's do that. Oh, I work at a record store at the same time in my 18th year. I was a senior in high school. So I'm working at these two very cool music jobs, making money you know, <laughs> to yeah. fulfill a musical career. Then I moved um, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and went to an art, inst art school there, the Art Institute, met more people, started playing more, started doing all that kind of stuff. And it was always just about survival. And for me, survival was learning how to survive in any kind of contemporary music situation, whether it was blues, rock, jazz, country, R&B, any of those singer songwriter, Americana, as it's called now, whatever. I can to this day say, yeah, put me in any of those situations. I'll 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 do I'll do the job and I'll do it well because I've trained myself to to do that. So that's what kind of catapulted me to Nashville. I was like, well. I was playing these jazz and blues gigs in Pittsburgh for three hours and I would make the same money I'd play in a country gig in 90 minutes. And it was more fun and there are more people and there's probably more girls too. Well, there definitely were. So all that was exciting to my, you know, mid twenties you know, self. Um, so I started playing a lot of country and I was interested in legitimate country for a long time. Um, and then moved to here to Nashville and, hit the ground running. I had a gig before I even moved to town, which was cool. And just started kind of doing the hustle, touring and vans and um, then got to go to buses and planes and back to vans. And, you know, <laughs> and then there you do some sessions in between and you're trying to balance all that stuff. And that it, once I was also doing that, I had friends from working in those music stores that worked at you know, Fender and Line 6 and Universal Audio and a number of different companies. Because also, once you meet friends that work for those music companies, they get bigger and better jobs in other music companies. And then your reach just keeps growing and growing and growing. And they said, well, we need a guy that can demonstrate this product. And this is 2007. Nobody's doing that, right? And I was like, okay, let me see what that's about started doing that for Fishman that parlayed into my work with Martin guitar that worked with parlayed into universal audio. So you just become this guy that's like making way more money doing that stuff mm -hmm. than any gig I ever had. You know, I mean, uh, I started doing NAM shows for universal audio and it was like, you know, they'd pay me more than, you know, five gigs in a week, you know? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, this is cool. I get to stay in a hotel, walk to NAM play the ox box for a couple hours and then move on, you know? So you position yourself to try to uh, survive in the best way you can while having fun playing music. Right. The thing that's helped me, I think, is that I figured out how to be uh, a little more business-like than the average person. So, oh, I got to learn how to fill out an expense account or expense report. Okay. I can do that. I got just keeping all your ducks in a row business-wise. And the third piece of that was the, when I started working for Fishman, I always leave things out. Sorry. When I was working for Fishman doing the first sort of demos that they ever did online, um, the company Truefire was actually shooting and hosting them. And Truefire said, oh, you, you do this really well. Do you teach? And I was like, hell yeah, I teach. I teach like 60 kids a week, which was I, I've taught more than that. But that was the average. And they said, well, that's really what we do. And then that relationship started. And then I started doing courses with them. That evolved into me working with some other companies. And then from there, I started my own lesson company in 2022. And that's where I am and is a large part of my focus today. Right. So so it's all a funnel, you know, right. into where I'm at now. Is that still something uh, that you foresee? The, the part of it, the demonstration thing at NAMS and other music conventions, is that something that you foresee as continuing or or what do you think the trend with that is as far as NAM shows and things of that nature is? Um, well, well, for me, it's not so much in my future anymore. I like to, last year I went to NAM for the first time and didn't have to do anything. 
Yeah. Which is great. I didn't have any obligations to be at any booths. Um, it's fun. I like to do it. Universal Audio is my favorite company to work with in that uh, arena because um, they treat you fairly. They they work with you on trying to put the best presentation that you want to put together. It's fun. Uh, the people that are there are great. Um, but I don't really see myself doing that much anymore because just walking around Nam and not having any obligations is great. And then you want to drive down to you know, Laguna, 20 minutes down the road, go ahead and, you know, and then leave NAMM show behind. Like that sounds like a perfect day to me. Um, but as far as the NAMM show goes, um, I, I think it's consistently teetering on whether it will be a thing or not. I think it will for a, a while, but if you don't go just watch everything online, you're not missing anything. The right. best reason to go to NAMM is to see your friends around the industry that you haven't seen in a year. Right. You know, because I'll get to see people from other countries and meet new people that I've talked to online, but never met face to face. Um, and I get to see some of my my really, really good friends. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, seeing gear demonstrated these days on online and YouTube is and seeing all the different people's different takes on it is a, probably a lot more appealing way of learning about new pieces of gear and technology that's coming. Yeah. Out. I think we're in a shift too, because um, I, I don't know what these companies are doing, putting out a product every week when you haven't let the consumer digest the one you put out last month. Right. Um, it's, it's getting to be kind of exhausting. I talked to a friend that does YouTube videos weekly on the subject and he was like, man, nothing really excites me anymore. We're getting to a place where just like they're rehashing old movies, you know, and old TV shows, they're doing that with all gear. They're, I mean, Fender brought the Sun stuff back out. I remember when they did that the first time. And then before that, they bought Sun, you know, in the 70s or whatever. I can't remember what era it was. But it's like, wow, am I old enough now to see two resurgences of the same freaking product <laughs> now painted as being new? Um, it's a soapbox that I could get really cranky about because I have a love and passion for the musical instrument industry. And I just think it's... Um, I think I just think it's out of control at the moment. People got spoiled with COVID and, you know, how much money everybody made um, because everyone was home to spend it. And now they're like, we got to put all these products out. Why isn't anybody buying them? Yeah. Because they can go outside. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm curious to hear who some of the uh, influences were and continue to be and maybe new players that are uh informing that not necessarily guitar players but any players that are informing your style because i i definitely the things that i've seen you do i definitely hear the uh robin ford and the more uh sophisticated blues side of your playing but i'd be interested in hearing about other country influences and that sort of thing um yeah you know it started with stevie ray vaughn and hendrix for me um now that being said there were the the metal and the grunge era people that highly influenced me too. I, I mean, I, I really love, you know, I grew up loving, you know, anything that was on MTV at the time, right. um, which was awesome. And then, you know, when I seeing Mike McCready look Stevie Ray Vaughan esque in a Pearl Jam video in the nineties was amazing to me, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, just everything of that era, Stone Temple Pilots, uh, uh, Soundgarden, Allison Chains, loved Jerry Cantrell, you know, loved Zach Wild, loved all those, you know, that was me at 16 years old or whatever. And um, just absolutely loving that stuff. But again, realizing like, okay, I don't look great with long hair. I can't grow it very well. I don't have the look. <laughs> I don't look good in flannel. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> Doc Martens are cool, but not, they don't look good. On, like, you know, it's one of those things like, okay, well, I, I feel like playing this more sophisticated music works a little bit more for me. Um, you're right. And then I did find Robin. Um, but, you know, I've been as influenced by, as much influenced by Prince as I was by Daniel Lanois. So completely different ends of the guitar spectrum. But I had periods where I would deep dive into people like that. Spend six months with Schofield, spend six months with Mike Stern and just do nothing but burn their cassettes, burn their CDs to cassettes so I could play them in my player or get the adapter to play them in my car stereo and right. do nothing but listen to Upside Downside and Jigsaw and all those things for oh, yeah. weeks, you know? And then uh, full transparency, I don't do that at all anymore. Not at all. The only person I want to hear play guitar is me right. because I've never 
given my chance, self a chance to do that. The problem with what I said, said earlier about being a guitar player for hire and for a living all these years is that you just sound, try to sound like somebody else all the time because that's what gets you the work. You know, you're trying to sound like the best version of whoever your client needs at the time. And now with being able to promote yourself online, have a lesson company, have a YouTube channel that's growing, you know, play my own gigs under my own name in Nashville. Never had a plan to do that. Never thought I'd be able to do that. Never thought people would come. And I'm just playing some of my songs and mostly like obscure blues covers done in a weird way to make it funky and right. improvisational. Right. And people show up. And they like it. And I'm like, maybe right. I'm on to something, you know, who knows? Well, it sounds like your trajectory, it, it made a lot of sense because it was, you never got the cart before the horse. You're con consistently doing steps forward to introduce yourself to a bigger sphere of influence. And before you know it, you're able to have an audience, a platform for people to come out that know you and say, oh man, he's playing tonight at whatever, you know, yeah, Z or whatever it might be. Oh yeah, I, you know, I'll come check it out. They find, you know, and because of the nature of what you're doing, no show really has to be scripted and it could, it's an ever evolving thing. Totally. It, yeah. so, there was a, a thing that I was watching. Pat Metheny was basically, I'm just paraphrasing what he said, but he has to be the listener to every note that he plays and he has to be excited and he has to be enthused. So yeah. as long as you're not painting yourself into a narrow lane where you have to feel like, okay, I've got to do this very prescriptive thing. It's right. really exciting for you and in turn for the audience. Yeah. One of the most, uh, you know, sort of handcuffing things I found in music was playing the average Nashville road gig. I mean, you're probably playing the same now, you know, I might feel this way if it was a, the biggest of the big acts, you know, but most of the time, it's highly scripted. You're playing the same thing for 75 minutes to 90 minutes at a time. 90 is a long show yeah. in the country, you know, country world. Um, there's little improvisation. Um, you get very tiny bars to do it. And that's, I forced myself into that and realized that it was like not inspiring at all. Um, so I had to find a way to like, and then you don't want to play and then you don't want to practice when you're off the road or in your back of the bus. You just want to go take a walk or a run or grab a snack or something like that. You just don't want to sit in the back of a bus and hear the generator running while you're trying to learn arpeggios. Like it's, it's not fun. It's, I'd rather do it on my couch with my dogs next to me. You know what I mean? And then make a lesson out of it and people can enjoy that, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that's the... Uh, in, in fact, this is another thing it would be nice to have you elaborate on, elaborate on but the key to the YouTube um, content is trying to be your most authentic self. Right. And like you say, if, if you're at home with the dogs, making con you know, playing guitar, working on new material, documenting that, coming up with things that are truly authentically your own, you will build an audience and you don't have to have a two million subscribers, but the however many it may be of those you 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 want the core of people to know know you as a person. And who who are you authentically, not you trying to be somebody else, which I think could be really a challenge for a lot of folks. Yeah, because it as a musician, you're not encouraged to do that. You know, as a traditional side person musician, you're encouraged to be heard and not seen. You know, and that's the problem I think most musicians find when they're like, I hate to do social media. Yeah, because you have to be yourself. Yes. You know, the spotlight's on you now, you know, and I, I have to turn it on in front of a camera. Otherwise, it'd be super boring, you know, but at the same time, it's really me. I'm excited about what I'm talking about. I'm excited for the person on the other end to get something out of it. And at the end of the day, I'm excited to build the audience as well. If more people like that, great, because that that helps me in other ways. Um, but um, there's no real way to do it but to do it. You just have to try. My first videos go something like, hey, thanks for watching. We're going to do this to more, more excited and more happy that you're here watching, you know, and that feels actually better that way.
you know? Yeah. And it's contagious. I mean, it's, it's you being you, but it's just an amped up thing of being excited yeah. and being comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. I mean, I'm genuine, generally a pretty reserved, uh, uh, introverted kind of person, but I've had to work hard to, right. to learn how to step out of that for a moment and then go back and recharge the batteries. Um, like after I do this podcast with you, I'll have to sit down for about 15 or 20 minutes and re-energize. Um, so, and that's just whether I do a live stream stream or I do a live stream with, um, my VIP subscribers to my site and it, it pretty much zaps me for most of the day. Really? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. And I've, I'm not the only person I've ever heard it's talk about that. Isn't it? Cause uh, you and I are similar in that regard in terms of being a, in my day to day life. Um, I am a more laid back guy, but I, I, in a week from now, I'm finishing up my first intermediate online guitar course that I'm going to be launching. And it, it's, been very um, eye opening to because there's over 50 hours of content and seven lesson modules and that kind of stuff, just how um, you have to amplify who you are and I'm not normally that kind of a person, you know, but when so it, it, it's very refreshing to hear that. Yeah, no, you have to be engaging and somebody that someone wants to watch. You know, that's why most people fail at it is because they don't have the personality to yeah. present it. Now, that being said, I didn't have the personality. I had to learn how to grow, you right. know, and how to be that, that guy. And it's not, it feels normal now. It just feels right. totally normal. Was there anybody that, uh, that in the, as you were getting into developing your own channel and your own um, business, anybody that you were watching not to copy certainly but to that you were like wow that person is doing a fantastic that that's somebody that i could you know take. yeah well when i sorry um that's all i have yeah oh, thanks um when i when i started doing the true fire thing and that was what was great about true fire because now now you see them they're they have celebrity guitar players all the time right but they would tell me they're like you guys are the real core because you're the good teachers we need the celebrities to get people in the door but it was funny because we were amassing a fan base and i know that we sold a lot of courses for them because the the celebrities could come in and make a big splash but then they don't have the consistency that like someone who's trying to also teach as a real, you know, profession can offer. Um, but when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd watched, you know, hot licks courses and star licks and all those things. Um, so I started looking at true fire when I started back in like Oh seven. And it was pretty much like Jeff McElane and Robbie Calvo who have become really good friends. Uh, I speak to Jeff weekly. Um, he was one of the early he and Robbie were one of the few two people that were really early on with them. So yeah. I watched them to kind of just see how to do it, you know, and I continued to get better and better and better at it um, to the point now where it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to sit down and teach, but it's more comfortable. Right. Um, and then I didn't really know much about YouTube. I was pretty resistant. And part of it was because I was, the typical guitar player that didn't think anyone that worked on YouTube was legitimate. And I'm going to be honest, everybody, any people will say that behind closed doors. Don't let them fool you. <laughs> they might be nice to your face, but then you're like, ah, oh, that guy's just a YouTuber. I, I've heard it. It happens. And then I was like, nah, I was probably the same kind of way until I met people that said, no, this is how we actually grow to have our own businesses. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, you're working for those other people that are taking a huge percentage of what you do when you could be making all the money and be in control of all the content yourself. And two of the biggest influences in that arena were um, Tim Pierce and Brett Papa. They're, oh, yeah. um, they're tremendous uh, personalities, knowledgeable, and great businessmen. And I've gotten – I'm close with both of them. I just spent about four days with Tim – uh, doing some video stuff, doing some hanging, going to guitar shops and just being in a room with a guy that I admire who's done everything I wanted to do as a guitar player, but now he's doing it in another career and he's even more successful at that. And we share the same feelings. We, we just spoke yesterday about ideas for whatever. And he's, com 
he's so much about you having your individuality not taken from you or your product or your property. He was like, you need to do your own thing. And YouTube and starting your own company afterwards is the way. And I was like, really? You know, and then Brett was like, you got to buy a camera, get started. It'll work. Trust me. <laughs> and then it worked, you know, and it's, it's working. Like the only downside is that I didn't get started 10 years ago. Like those guys did. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder to get an audience. I mean, you know, YouTube experts will say, oh, there's a way that you can get 100,000 subscribers in a month if you do this, this, and this. Yeah, but I don't have time to make a video every day and be shock value and all that stuff. I just put this stuff out as consistently as I can to, you know, ed entertain the audience I have. Um, that being said, I'm totally fine with the growth and what's happening. I know more about the business than I ever have. I'm smarter. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, business owner now. So it's like all those things have changed and it's because of just, just not being afraid, stepping into it and trying it. Right. Yeah. That's uh, in the beginning when you're seeing that uh, the people that are successful doing it and you're not quite sure you feel like every year that passes, you're that fur much further along. But I, I think that, you know, when you, when you're doing something, when you're doing the hard work, it does pay off because people will find if it's really good, like obvious what you're doing is really good quality stuff. It's maybe not you weren't doing it at the same time that Tim and right did, but the results speak for themselves. So it's. a uh, Yeah, and that's what they that's what they preached to me. And that's what uh, I had to kind of have faith in was just just do it. And then I, I met um, someone who's become pretty much like my manager for this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's, he has a great mind in the world of online marketing and he's taught me more in three years than I could have ever imagined and really helped to, uh, you know, accelerate growth in all areas. Yeah. Um, is that something that you would foresee yourself doing at some point as your business growing and being a consultant on this? Because what you've amassed Besides the musical, the, the guitar part of it, learning the business of it, it seems like that could be a nice component to your business is doing consulting, because I think people are going to continue to want it. There's still people right now who are thinking, man, I would love to get into this. Yeah. And it would be great for there to be folks like yourself or Tim or Brett or whomever to, to help guide people like a manager, you know, you, you can stop when you're managing somebody in their career. Yeah. I think that's something that my manager and I have talked about um, because I know I'm a good teacher and communicator. And I think I could communicate it best to people that were eager to, to learn, you know, in the sense of, that we're musicians, basically, you know what I mean? And the problem is, is that you have to step aside and say, there's my love for the art and why I started this when I was a kid. But then there's this other area that I have to get serious about that is business and marketing and sales and all that kind of stuff too. And I could not think of that, of two more diametrically opposed concepts in a musician's brain because I told people for years, ah, I don't, I don't want to be a guitar teacher. I don't want to be an online guitar instructor. I don't want to be this or that. And I bucked it for many, many years um, and still I'm sure people think of me, oh, he's that guy that teaches, he does. It's like, no, I'll play in any band and I'll crush it and I'll do a great job. And the older I get, the more confident I am because I know I'll do a great job. I'll bring the tones, I'll bring the playing, I'll bring the parts, I'll do all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Doesn't really pay great. And I need to, I need to make a living. <laughs> so I need to figure something else out. So let me get these other seven other streams of revenue I can I can muster but you know who doesn't have the energy for that is the musician who's still over here saying I just want to play man I just want to play gig well have you watched the landscape of shit after before and after COVID it's it's crazy how challenging it is to even get gas in your vehicle you know yeah well the, the, again going back to the idea of all the things that you're doing that are of, of the more business variety allow you to bring so much more joy and creativity to when you are playing live because you're not being yeah. playing parts for somebody or being a yeah. song you're doing your own and that 
if if nothing else, that should be the besides the financial re remuneration, that should be the greatest joy because you're able to be your true authentic self on stage in front of an audience yeah. doing exactly what your heart, you know, is leading. I, I, I couldn't have said it better. That was a very great way to, to put it because that's more or less what Brett told me or early on. He's like, if you just put a few years in at this, he's like, you'll be able to book your own gigs, hire your own players, make your own music, book your own recording studio time, all that kind of stuff. And he's right. I've been doing that for the past two and a half years. And yeah. the past year that I've had, you know, my, my small band, when those guys who are touring Nashville professionals that I've worked with on the road in different bands, when they say, Oh, this is the highlight of my month when we get to do your gig. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, all the payment yeah. I need. That's, that's all. I, yeah. I can't imagine as it blows my mind that they would say that. Yeah, it's a it's a funny thing that the, the circuitous route that it takes to get to where you are now. But that's really at its core. When you're a kid, where you are now is where you wanted to be. Yeah. I mean, I'm just doing this video with all of these amazing amplifiers that I have and like this beautiful shelf that a friend of mine custom made you know it's got the switcher i can switch between any of these it's like i wish i had this shit in my 20s you know it's like but now i have it when i can afford it but keep in mind those things are all there's deals behind all of these you know who did i know that got me an artist deal or who right. gave me a i traded this for that you know it's like i'm not going in and plunking down like five grand at sweetwater every week you know right. um yeah. there, there's always a way to make it work yeah. And uh, is that something that was uh, that, that? Well, I think I know the answer to this question, but I would think that's another great thing about the business part of it is being able to have affiliate marketing with those businesses that you've Sweetwater or whomever. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a perk. I mean, anybody that you're watching on YouTube who has a gardening channel or a cooking channel or they will put links to their amazon affiliates there so they get a commission when somebody clicks on a link and um and we definitely do that with sweetwater and there's other companies out there that are engaging in it more and more now also um and it, it's it's no different in my opinion i know people get i think the average like armchair guitar player slash youtube critic is like, oh, these guys are just trying to make money. I remember when YouTube was free. It's like, it was never free. There was always ads, but yeah. it was for Lexus. <laughs> now Sweetwater is sponsoring my video, just like they sponsor podcasts. And it's like, you would never say, ah, oh, I'm not drinking Pepsi because they're selling out and buying a Super Bowl ad. It's like, right. no, that's what makes the world go around. And sorry that I'm a guitar player that figured out how to do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I th the the people that exist like that are just you know, it's it it sadly they're always yeah. there, but they're they're the ones that are on the on the sidelines watching life happen. Right, and they're not doing it. They're just it's easier to crit to be a critique or a critic of something than to actually do something. Yeah, I like that you said the sidelines of that because it's very much like that. It's like I'm in here getting. I'm getting the scrapes and the bruises and the blood and, and, and all that kind of stuff from getting, you know, companies hounding me to do this or that, or, you know, um, I got to return all these emails to my students having questions about my lesson content. You know, it's like you, you, one of my biggest heroes in this world is Seth Godin. Um, oh. And I've, re I've read a bunch of his books and even the tattoo of Icarus on my arm is do is a tribute to his book, the Icarus deception, because it, it's all about just keep going, just keep doing it. There's an audience for you. And when you find that audience, you have to nurture the audience. And that is the single most difficult yet rewarding aspect to all of it. The audience is great, but they want your attention and you need to give it to them at a certain, to a certain degree, you know, the, um, I, I like what you were saying about having, uh, folks that are reaching out to you that you're so approachable in terms of students reaching out about questions about content and things and being feeling connected. And that's really what is the, uh, the, th the stickiness of why people have chosen you because they feel like you're accessible, you're approachable, you're out there. He's on my team. You know, he's my coach. He's, he's the guy that yeah. me get from point A to point B. And that, 
that has a, a wellspring or a ground or what a, a ground swell, I guess, because sure. the, the experience that those folks are having with you, they will tell more people you can't buy that kind of marketing of people. And that's Corey is fucking amazing. He's on top of stuff. I, I was having this difficulty with the, you know, improvising over whatever it might, whatever the thing might be. He helped me out, sent me a text, uh, encouraging me, sent me an email. That's, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And it's, um, it, it's something I try to stay on top of. Um, but sometimes it's, there's so much that it, it, it gets to be a lot. Um, but that's what I signed up for. Um, and those people that are paying me monthly to, to check out my stuff, they're the most valuable people next to my family <laughs> because to me, it doesn't matter how much they pay. That's important. Even the people that send me just an email address to sign up for my list, I'm not selling it. I'm not trading it. I'm not giving it away unless we have a contest where we agree that the, the partner gets the email address to, but that's always in the, in the rules. <laughs> but the point is, is like, there's a level of trust that you have to build. Um, and sometimes, sometimes somebody gets offended by something or you're not meeting them at the timely manner that works for them. You just got to let it go and say, no, I guess our relationship doesn't work out. And then we move on to the people who are, you know, happy to, to hear from me at any point. So, yeah. but it's yeah. a process. Yeah. Uh, are you getting, um, requests to do recording uh the studio stuff in the studio where you do your youtube content is that all i can i can see the amps and everything but i didn't know if you if it's a recording a home studio in there as well yeah um i do pretty much all that in this room um my the session stuff isn't as busy as it once was i turned down quite a bit too just because um you know, I've been working on a YouTube video for since Tuesday, and I'm just starting to edit it today. So that took a lot of my time where if somebody sends me a song or two, it'll take me the whole day to work on it because I spend more time than the average sort of Nashville session would be on a song. Um, I, I try to spend the whole day to really make sure that, excuse me, I'm, I'm happy with the parts before they go out. But I still really, I like doing sessions. Um, it's a, uh, it's a really fun, creative thing. But again, um, you're usually working with people that have a pretty limited budget. Yeah. Um, and if you're dealing with a label that hires you, you're probably not going to see the money for six months. So pick your poison. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'd be interested to, to hear about what a, a tip, your process might be. You don't have to go into great detail, but from, from A to Z, when, something a video that somebody might enjoy that's like five minutes long what what does that look like are you are you a, the the only guy in the studio with the multi-camera setup or what what does that look what yeah what i'm a um i'm a one-man show um i don't i do everything on my own um so from start to finish it's generally my favorite videos to do are teaching videos and i've stepped away from that because you get the carrot dangled from a company that says, we'll pay you this much to do this. And then you do the video and you're not as fulfilled. The video doesn't do well. There's a whole bunch of other, you know, uh, corporate things you got to jump through to work with them sometimes. Um, so I don't really love that work all the time. And I've, I've turned most of it down for the, for, for the foreseeable future. But like, for instance, doing this video on the Kahayan switcher. It's a switcher that you can hook a bunch of amps to and with the push of a button, turn any of them on. Is that the, um, it's, is that the Amp Pete thing? Is that the single it's, round? Amp Pete's a different company, but they do a similar thing. Um, so yeah, similar. Um, I started working on a, a musical track on Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, I started sh shooting the performance parts of it. Yesterday was Thursday. I shot the talking head and demo parts. Friday to this today, I just started mixing the audio before we jumped on this call and I got to sift through all these hours of footage. I'd like to launch it tomorrow, but I probably won't be able to because it's that deep. Um, so it can be, a, that's a rather long one. If it's just a two camera shoot of me and the guitar teaching a concept, I can wrap that up in a day. Um, but inside of all that, there's the thumbnail, there's the title, there's the description. If I'm using any affiliate products, there's the links. I got to go create the links for all that. 
Um, I got to promote it in a couple different areas once it launches. Um, a lot of people are maniacal about, oh, the video is not as popular as it should be. Let me try a different thumbnail. Let me try a different title. And you just keep kind of playing this game to see if you can get more views on your on your video, you know, because the, the more views, the better. Right. Now, is that I, I'm not aware of that that's something that you could do is you put the video out with a thumbnail. And if it's, it's not getting you the traction that you'd like, you can pull that back, change the thumbnail, try it again, see if that has more traction. Yeah, you just you don't you don't take the video down. You just uh, change the thumbnail while the video's still published. Oh, okay. um, and you can do that with the title, too. Um, and th those are the two biggest things um, that help give your video reach. Right. Just some, yeah, a catch some sort of eye catching thing or. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily, I, I, they've used the, the, the phrase clickbaity, but it, right. they want something that is going to, the caption has to also speak to what it is, but in a way that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, clickbait is fine if you deliver on the clickbait. <laughs> right, yeah. Like if you say, this is the worst guitar I've ever played, and then you start talking about how great the guitar is. You've never said why it's the worst, you know? Um, now, if you said this is the worst guitar I've ever played because I want to get rid of all my other ones, it ruined me. This guitar is so amazing. This is the worst. You know, I'm just <laughs> right, coming yeah. up something off the top that's, of my head. But that's, um, that's a good, cool idea. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of how the mind of a YouTube creator kind of works, you know? it's um, Or well, I'm trying to think of, like the the arpeggio video you mentioned that I did about Larry Carlton, you know, I just said, you've never played triads this way. And the video did really, really well because of that, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, what, what is next uh, for you? What's coming up? What, what are some of the things that are just maybe that you've been working towards that it might be a little bit beyond your reach that we can expect fans of yours, uh, Anything that you can share, any new exciting projects that are coming up? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's what I'm really excited for is being home. I've never said this in my entire life. I'm excited for winter <laughs> because I want to like hunker down and get back to business. I spent yeah. most of uh, September and October playing a lot. Yeah. Um, I played a lot in September and October, did some really fun shows, um, threw a vacation in there, which I've never done. Um, the first vacation I ever took for myself that wasn't work related and that I paid for myself. Wow. First time. Where'd you go? So I went to California and I spent a couple of days, like I said, with Tim. And then my wife joined me later in the week and we went to Disneyland and did a bunch wow. of other things. And we had an amazing time. Um, just hearing my wife say, I'm sad to come home, but I also want to come and see the dogs because <laughs> she really loved it was like all the payment I needed. It was, it was so worth it. Um, and uh, that was a huge thing. Just sitting out on the Malibu pier and just saying, Oh yeah, I don't, I don't have to be anywhere. Yeah. It was a great, great feeling. Cause usually it's always like you, you piggyback off of a gig or a trip, you know, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be playing here. And, and then my wife's going to come while I'm here because the artist or the label paid for your airfare, you know, it's like, um, yeah, that's awesome. But you were still kind of shackled to work for, for a little bit um those are first world problems but it yeah. was an achievement to actually pay for a vacation for myself yeah we we especially as uh when you're a self-employed musician we are we carry a stigma about being a musician there's what yeah what people perceive you might be if you're a musician so we have that we overcompensate and we tend to try to take on more stuff and we feel guilty if we yeah. take a trip like what you're suggesting um oh yeah I, no breaks <laughs> fly out once a month uh, to la to do a, a show with um, a saxophone player that toured with pink floyd and we would do these things in this immersive uh, video experience kind of like the thing that u2 is doing now but it was pink cool. floyd music with some of the folks that toured with pink floyd and uh i felt guilty if i had an afternoon off where i could drive to tarzana and go to norms yeah or, I was staying in Studio City. I would feel guilty that I'm sitting outside enjoying the weather and a cup of coffee and getting some lunch, going to, you know, a bookstore. 
because you're always on the treadmill of thinking, you know, I've got to be doing more, you know, what, and, oh, yeah. you know, you, you want to hunker down and just sit and work on stuff on your laptop in your room. It's like, I'm in LA for 72 hours. I should at least do something that's going to yeah. be a little me time. So. Yeah. When I was staying, um, I was staying at this hotel in Woodland Hills because I wanted to be close to Tarzana and I wanted to be close to, you know, Tim lives there. And, um, and I got there on a Saturday, Saturday night was kind of a waste. Cause I got in late Sunday. I just kind of got a coffee and just walked around. And then I started working on these songs that I had to play for a show the following week. <laughs> and I didn't get out of the hotel until it was like one o'clock. I was like, wait a second, you dummy, go take a break. Like, yeah. So I drove, I drove through Topanga Canyon and had an amazing time doing that and like went to Malibu and then went back and, you know, hit a couple shops and then went back to my hotel. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah. cause I, it was in, ingrained, like, you know, you, you're here to work. You know, I had a whole practice rig with an, you know, an amp simulator and, and headphones and all this stuff. And yeah. it was funny. But like you, I, I, I'm looking forward to this. I live in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. My wife and I live on the lake and all the colors are changing. It's getting cool out. But yeah, just being, I'm launching my first uh, ever guitar course. So that's uh, a nerve wracking experience because I'm, I'm kind of where you were uh, maybe, I don't know, five, 10 years ago. You know, I'm kind of, a, I, I have a successful Pink Floyd tribute band and I have a lot of students, but I'm tired of trading time for hours. Yeah. Or dollars for hours. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And trying to make more sense out of, <clears throat> I've been teaching for 35 years, so I would like to pivot into something that makes more sense for me, but it's a, yeah, definitely. It's a nerve wracking thing when you, <laughs> if you can remember back when you started this process. Oh, I remember it too clearly so much. So I like to forget it. <laughs> Well, I, I look forward to getting out to Nashville um, and come to check out the band. I've got some friends out there that uh, that I'd like to visit and come see you play. Uh, I'll have to get on your website and check out when you're. Um... Yeah, I mean, I hope to book stuff for 2024. Um, I, I try to play once a month or so. The thing is, is like, you know, I have to be able to afford to play because there's no money in any of the clubs here. Don't let anybody kid you unless you're playing four hours on Broadway without a break, you know, and you're playing a bunch of cover tunes, but like doing my thing, I have to pay all my guys oh, yeah. and you know, it's, it's not cheap to, to do a, a 75 minute show. That's it. I, I want to make sure the guys are taken care of uh, and want to keep doing it. And, you know, Having a good attitude and being a good leader helps, but money helps a lot more. It's what Duke Ellington said. They said, how do you have such a great band all the time? He said, I pay them. <laughs> and yeah. I respect them, you know? That was Frank Zappa's thing is like, uh, he said, people think I'm a cruel task mask or task master because I have such high standards for my musicians. But he said, I'm essentially the referee between the audience that bought a ticket. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you've bought your ticket. Okay, band, give it to them better than they've than you could ever expect. So his, he would spend a half a million dollars back in the 70s rehearsing a band for a couple months to get them ready to go do a tour that may or may not be a huge windfall for him. Right, right. I mean, I I know that I, I have a, a friend that I look up to and that's a really successful musician. And he says when he goes on tour, it's he breaks even, you know? but he does it because that's part of the thing, you know, it's going to, it's going to help him in other ways, get more production clients or whatever, but, um, and it's a passion, but he could afford to do the passion because of the other things that he does, you know? Well, if you decide uh, that you would like to get into the world of uh, being a, a musical equivalent of a Seth Godin, you know, and you're looking for your first client. <laughs> uh, yeah. I I definitely need somebody that uh, that I could uh, pay as a manager uh, to get me to the promised land or not not the huge distance, but just the next step and doing the correct steps, because I think that's the key here is you've taken the correct steps that didn't make you go backwards. And that that's as as important as anything else is getting the sequence of things correct. Yeah, there's that concept of like you're only as successful as the people you surround yourself with. 
Right. Um, and I'm a walking tribute to that. I, I seek out who I think are the good, honest people who, um, one of my dear friends, he says, one of us, and he goes, we'll, we'll meet somebody. He goes, yeah, he's not one of us. And I know exactly what he means when he says that. And I love that guy so much that the fact that he thinks I'm one of us is, is a huge deal. Um, but you can tell, like when I met my manager from the first five minutes, I said, this guy's going to be an asset and a friend for life. And we're, we're as good of friends as we are business clients. We have, he'll say, can we have a friend call? And I'll be like, yeah, he goes, can we have a break? <laughs> so we know like how to kind of decipher. And it's, it's just fun having somebody in your court for a change. And I've worked with so many artists here in Nashville and they all have a manager and a publicist and a publisher and a, you know, all the people at the label. And it is wild to watch that team work for one person, you know, and the good artists know how to handle it. The bad artists don't I'll just say that, you know, they just squander it, you know? Well, thank you so much for your generosity and uh, yeah, you're, I, I knew instantly as we got talking that uh, you were, you know, cool guy, stand up guy and somebody I could, you know, resonate with so I appreciate oh, it. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks for all of the the kindness and uh all of the important um things that we touched on that I think can help people. Yeah, absolutely. Well have a great week and enjoy your uh weekend off. Thanks so much. I will. Yeah. Have a great yep. one. Thanks. Bye. See you. Thank you for tuning in to the Guitar Hang Podcast. Interviews with noteworthy guitar players from around the world. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications to stay updated on our latest episodes.